Dan. And um, this includes uh, CRP fields, so, you know, Rome fields planted to CR, uh, CRP fields planted to Rome, uh, old abandoned old fields that have turned mostly to non-native cool season grasses, and of course pastures that tend to become dominated by uh, non-native cool season grasses. Um, basically, the key to success in converting these areas is um, first off selecting the right species for the site. And to this, I refer you to DNR Technical Bulletin 188, help give you some guidance on how to find the right species for your geographic area and soil types, soil moisture regime, et cetera. Um, next is achieve, achieving good seed soil contact, uh, which ends up in maximizing germination. And finally, uh, controlling competition. Uh, the I, the uh, importance here is letting sunlight get to those seedlings so they can establish. And lastly, um, planting at the best time of year. Um, in general, fall is probably the best overall for planting prairie, um, but a general rule of thumb is that as soon as the seed ripe is ripe, the better you get it onto the ground, the better. So um, it's just a, a general rule of thumb. One exception for this are, native, are warm season grasses. Um, they actually will do better if planted in the spring, especially late spring. But for forbs and most of the cool season grasses, fall or as soon as seeds ripe is the best best time to do it, give you the best success. <clears throat> to, to, to make this happen or try to get it to happen, there are four basic options you can take and methods. One is tillage. Start basically starting over from scratch. A spraying, heavy spraying, basically starting from scratch, depending upon the levels, degree of spraying you do. And then uh, what, what's generally called interseeding, where you don't disturb the sod that much uh, other than burning and just broadcast seed onto the surface. And, and or combinations of these three to, and, and together, depending upon the situation. Uh, tillage. It's generally not advised, um, especially if you have relatively mature established sod. Um, you just essentially are gonna damage the, that soil structure that maybe took several decades to develop. Um, you could start to damage soil organisms that may have taken decades uh, to redevelop and establish communities. And you also run in, a lot of you probably experienced, run into the potential releasing weeds that are in the seed bank and get exposed to the light and often they're off and running. And um, if you happen to be on a site that might have some remnant or see some native plant still there for whatever reason, um, you lose desirable plants that are already present. Um, <clears throat> however, light disking um, may be a beneficial in getting things to move along under the right conditions. Again, depending upon all these other factors. Um, spraying, um, total killing of the sod, where you go in and try to just totally annihilate it, is, is not advised either because of the potential for releasing seed bank. And in my experience, and I wish we had long-term research going on do, on this, um, totally killing the sod, even though you get a quick start of a lot of the prairie species, in the long term, looks like it results in a less diverse prairie in something that's not quite um, as close to the original diversity, to the diversity of the original prairies. We really need research on this. It's just kind of personal observation on my part. Um, however, spraying that's used lightly or a low dose where you're getting just suppression and weakening of the sod is a far better approach, um, especially if you're in really productive soils. Also spraying, um, if you have a setting that's mostly brome and there's no native plants there and you got weeds like parsnip or sweet clover or you got woody plants invasion invading, using a broadleaf herbicide on those settings for a few years to get rid of, get rid of those plants before you start the interseeding is a, a really good idea and suggestion because once you start the burning with the interseeding and the prairie plants are coming, it's harder to go in and control those things. But there again, check for um, desire, desirable forbs first before you start using those broadleaf herbicides to try to control the undesirables. <clears throat> 
the interceding tool, that's the one that really seems to work well um, on these sites with some modifications. And it, it requires frequent fire. And there's no way around it. Um, some haying and mowing can get you close to that, but the frequent fire really seems to be the key in allowing this to work. And by frequent, I mean almost annually, if not annually, for at least the first 10, 15 years. And thereafter, you can back off. But um, low dose spraying, as I suggested before, on really highly productive soils um, can help a lot because the more productive the soil, the slower the interseeding seems to work. It does seem to work eventually, but it, it's, it's much slower. And I, we found that if you can get a, a, a very low uh, percentage of glyphosate, a one-time spraying, say in September, you don't kill out the sod completely, but you weaken that sod substantially without releasing the weeds in the seed bank. It's a real balancing act, but on highly productive sites, it seems to be pretty effective compromise in, in getting the prairie to come a little fast, come faster. And then I mentioned mowing. Um, I, when I say mow, mow, haying is ideal. That's where you're cutting and removing. That gets you the closest to mimicking the fire effect. It gets the nutrients in that litter off the site, which is important for prairies uh, to reduce the, the amount of nitrogen uh, on the site. And, and the mowing and removing gets you more sunlight to the, to the seedlings. Um, as I mentioned, when you start to go actually using interseeding, um, frequent fire is really important for a variety of reasons. It weakens the cool season grass, especially over time. Repeated burning, that grass gets weaker and weaker and thinner and thinner. It removes the litter. Often you have to do maybe two burns or three in some situations to get all of that old litter off the, off the soil. So you may have to burn two years before you even start your interseeding um, if it takes that long to get rid of all of that years of accumulation of litter on the soil surface. And one caution here, um, be very careful about late spring burns. Um, it's, it's very true, the later in the spring you burn, the more you weaken those cool season grasses. But once you start putting seed onto that site, to keep doing late spring burns runs the risk of killing off seedlings that have germinated from the previous fall. They're not, they can't take the fire if they're just a new, new, new seedlings, new cotyledons coming up. Plus, the late spring burning isn't critical to reducing those cool season grasses, especially when you're burning several years running. You'll get the same effect. It's just a lower, slower effect over time. Um, spraying, I kind of mentioned this already. If you got really productive, like mesic soils, wet mesic, really rich, productive soils, a lot of grass growth and competition, the slight specific sublethal application of glyphosate can um, get a, a good compromise between releasing all the seeds by killing the side versus just weakening it. And then there are some grass specific herbicides out there that, excuse me, that often don't totally kill the sod, but weaken it as well, uh, especially in situations like reed canary grass, uh, where grass specific herbicide can tip the balance. Um, although I found with eventual annual fire Especially if you can do some late spring fires, um, you can really push out reed canary as well, but it's a very slow process. And then the, the mowing and the hay removal that I mentioned before um, can be very helpful as well in the early stages and getting the sunlight down to those seedlings. Um, the, the frequent fire results in I mentioned before, a minimal release of weed seed bank compared to killing the sod, that's one advantage. It's proving very, very successful on dry and dry mesic sites. Um, the effectiveness on mesic to wet mesic sites is a little more questionable, it takes longer, it seems to be working, but it's one of these things I wish we had some research to really quantify just how much and what the time difference is. Um, and interseeding in general requires a little bit heavier seeding. I generally recommend seeding at least two years in a row um, with, uh, because of the, 
growing conditions are different each year. Uh, and it's a slow process. You have to be patient with interseeding. Um, in the first one to three years, even on the, the more, um, this, the drier or dry mesic sites are more amenable to this process or faster in this process. Even on those sites, the first one to three years, there's almost nothing that's evident. It doesn't mean there aren't seedlings there. There's just nothing big enough to really notice. And you really got to really hunt for them. Um, by years four through six, um, there's a slow increase in prairie plants. You start to see them more and more evident. Some start to bloom. When you get to year seven and nine, and that's what this whole process with the burning every year in, in early spring, basically, or late fall, but at least early spring, um, you start to get a rapid turnover and prairie plants starts to happen in that time period. And then by the time you, you get to 10 years or more, the diversity really starts to take off. And there's really not much sign of those cool season grasses that were there originally dominating the site. One caveat in here, once you get a lot of prairie developed and you start backing off on the frequency of the fires, if you go too long between fires, those cool season grasses weren't gone. They're there, but greatly reduced. And when you stop burning for three or four years, you'll see them making a comeback. In the long term, 30 years or plus, as I mentioned before, the results from this frequent fire interceding process seems to be getting real closer to the original prairie diversity than tillage or sod killing. Um, again, I really wish we had some long-term research going on just to verify and quantify this, but from my observation, that seems to be the case. Um, this is just showing you, I, I mentioned that when you weaken the sod or kill the sod, there's a majority of the prairie plants will come faster in that setting. Um, but there are some that actually come just as fast or faster in the interceding of fire. And this list is, is just a few that have kind of stood out in the, the observations and data collect that collection I have been doing on these sites. Can I jump in for just a second? Sure. We just had a question in the chat screen sure. that's relevant right here. So this is a question from Tom Weiss. For how many years of the first seven to nine years do you suggest broadcasting that seed? Oh, um, well, the more seed you do, the more diverse, the more you're going to get. The, the, the sites that I work on, we do at least two years running. And in some cases, we'll do it for a third year. But you can keep adding forever, actually. <laughs> if, if you get species you didn't have originally, just add them whenever you get them, and they're, they're eventually going to come. Got it. Thanks. And one more question, as long as we're paused here. What is your recommended bird frequency after those first 10 years? It depends on the site. Um, drier sites generally don't need to burn quite as often. They can go on a three to four year cycle, maybe, depending on the site and how much cool season grass is still there. The more productive the site, the mesic prairies, I, I think if you start going three years without fire in between, you're, you're gonna lose it back to the cool season or it's gonna not be as diverse as you want, put it that way. Um, the mesic sites, I, in the long term, I don't know how you can, you're going to be able to maintain them without probably burning every other year at least or burning two all of three years. And that, that annual fire, the first 10, 10 years is a minimum. Um, I would go 15 to 20 years before I start backing off, but you can play it by year and just see how it develops. If it starts looking really good, then start, you can start skipping some years and just play it by year and see how it goes. These restoring sites and cool seas are not like the original remnants in which you may you can get, get away of burning a little less often because they're already relatively intact. You're still going to be fighting these cool season grasses for, for possibly decades on end. And the more frequently you burn, the more you suppress them is the best I can say from my observations. Any, any other questions there? <laughs> 
Nope, not at the moment. Thank you. Please proceed. Sure. So this is just an example. I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures of these trials that I've done. I just didn't have presence of mind or think about our time. But this is a, a brome field, an old, old CRP brome field. And you can see strips that were sprayed in September. Um, we tried to do a low dose glyphosate, but I think we killed the little the sod a little more than we were trying. And you can see the sprayed strips are where all the growth high growth is. If you look closely, and this is in year two, so in the unsprayed strips, it's, it's dominated by brome, and you're not seeing any prairie plants, and you're not going to expect it in year two. But where you do spray, you can see all of these other things coming up. And I think most of you can see what those things are. There are thistles and parsnip, et cetera, et cetera. In the foreground, you can see a couple prairie plants in there, some Heliopsis and some black-eyed Susans and some you know, evidence of yellow coneflower coming. There is prairie coming in those sprayed strips, but you also released this uh, huge seed bank of weeds even though we we're trying to minimize that. And you can see we started mowing. You can see a strip where we started to mow those weeds. So you're going to have to mow these strips, and we did for a couple of years. But right now, I, I, I wish I had a follow-up picture four years later, now five years, those sprayed strips are pretty heavy with prairie plants. And while the inner seed, the interceding brome field strips are just starting to get some prairie plants. So the prairie has come faster where we've killed the sod, even with the weed issues. But 10, 15 years from now, my experience is those brome strips are going to start having a more equitable diversity among the species closer to a remnant than the sprayed strips, which tend to eventually become dominated by a smaller number of species. Um, Here's a, a little bit of data that I was able to collect. This is on, a, on, on two sites, one where we sprayed glyphosate Roundup three times a year, three years running. I mean, we killed the sod. And the objective was to, quote, in quotes, burn out that seed bank by letting it germinate every year with the sunlight. And by the third year, it looked like we weren't getting any weeds coming from the seed bank. And we planted a bunch of seed. Uh, guess what happened the next spring? A new flush of, of sweet clover and thistle and black medic that was still hanging in there, came up strong. And we had to mow the area several years before we could even start to carry a fire. And nearby, and very similar soils, similar sod, we were just burning the brome and interceding. And this chart just shows you um, the number of species detected flowering in the sixth year between the sod killed, spraying, spraying killing the sod, and just the interceding. And you can see in year six, um, the interceding is not not a not ahead. And by year eight, the the sprain is is ahead. You still have the effect of the the sprain cause some species to come faster to get to a flowering state faster. But as you get out to year 11 and 15, the interceding is caught up and starting to go ahead. If we um, just look at species uh, present detected, um, you could see the interceding e even early on was going ahead of the sprayed area in a state ahead over time. It just takes longer for those things to get established in flower. So just going to show you pictures of results. This was a CRP brome area dominated by brome and other that was 20 years old sod dominated by a wide range of non-native cool season grasses, quackgrass, bluegrass, timothy, red top, brome, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is after eight years of annual fire and scanning seed for two years. And you can see the results just in year eight. This is in that seven to nine year time frame when the prairie starts to explode and the cool season grasses become less and less evident. If you look at that real close, you can see uh, right smack dab in the middle, 
is a lily with three flower buds. So lilies are one of those species that come real nice into burn, burn, burn. Very, very, they do very well. Um, this is a 20 year old CRP brome field. After 20 years, uh, it was annually burned for about 16 years and then we started alternating thereafter. And the brome and cool season grasses are still in here. This is an area where we went on burn for one part of it for five years and the brome cool season grasses really made a comeback. Uh, this is an example of an old pasture dominated by non-native cool season grasses. It was a moist pasture. Uh, this is just a picture at year 13 after burning and interseeding. Um, you can see what's interesting here off to the, the right, I think. Uh, can you see my cursor? Does that come through to you guys? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. See yep. Right. So this is swamp louseworth. if anybody can recognize that. This is a cousin of woodbat bee, and just like its cousin, it's semi-parasitic. It, they go after fibrous rooted plants like grasses and sedges, reduce their stature, and allow for other prairies to, species to come in. This is mountain mint. I can't find anything in the literature about it being either semi-parasitic or alleopathic, putting out chemicals that suppress other plants like walnut, for example. Um, but it can uh, suppress sedges and big grasses as well. Rich, quick question um, coming from Mike asking, is no-till planting better than broadcast seeding for this strategy or would that be an option? By no, you mean with a seed drill? Likely so, yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I wish there was research on this. I, I don't even think about using seed drill because the broadcast seeding is yielding such good results. Now, if you did research, maybe for the amount of seed per seed, you might have better success, success with a seed drill but I suspect it would only be for the larger seeds. Most of these prairie species have very tiny seed that a seed drill buries them too deep and you, you lose the seed that they don't do well. Um, so it, I guess it would depend on the species, but I can't talk with authority about the statistics on that. Uh, all I can say is it's been working great without drilling in. One of the advantages of the drill is if you do have some litter layer, it can get your seed into that soil. Whereas the, the broadcast seeding is not gonna be very effective if you got a really dense, fine litter layer there of organic material it can't get through. I have a second question for you, Rich, um, not to divert sure. you too much. But you mentioned equitable diversity. Um, could you yeah. kind of define that? That's a new term for me, surprisingly, although I'm pretty sure I understand where it's coming from, but I'd just like you to define it for us, please. Yeah, I, I was, I'll, I'll talk about it now. I was gonna to touch on it later, but that's a, it's a really good point. And, and sometimes people lose these, use these terms rather loosely, including myself, but um, you have species richness which is just the number of species found in a unit area. Diversity is a combination of the number of species and the dominance or cover of those species, or sometimes it's called relative importance, where you combine the frequency of occurrence and then the percent cover of a species. So for example, you can have site A, with 100 species, site B with 100 species. They both have the same species richness, but site A is dominated by five species. All the others, 95 are there, but they're barely represented. Site B, all of those species have equal cover and dominance. Site B would be extremely diverse. So that's the equitability among species where site A would be low diversity, even though both sites have the same number of species. 
I hope that helps people in that regard. So what I think interceding is doing is resulting in a species diversity more reminiscent of what the original prairies are like. Because here I'm going to talk about this. When you do um, sod killing or tillage. And Let me pop in, if I may, just with one more question that came in. So when we're this comparison between the interceding in the brome strips and the strayed, the sprayed strips, are you planting the seeds at the same rate, same seeding rate? Oh yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, the seeds are broadcast all the way across that site equally. The only difference is that there were strips that were pray, sprayed. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, this is a brome field that was in more productive soil and this is was done before we really got into having into just interceding without any spraying. And so this was a one time spraying in September, but it was rather hot, a, a typical one and a half percent, something like that glyphosate uh, concentration. So it resulted in a pretty much killing the sod, even though it was just a one time in September. And so there wasn't much sod left. Um, and this is the picture three years afterwards got a lot of prairie plants coming. Um, I will mention that the first year we did get a flush of weeds and it was bad. And there was six, seven, eight foot tall giant ragweed. So we had to not cut, but cut and remove. If we had just cut that material, it would have smothered the ceiling. So we hate it. We took all the cut material off. And that helped a lot because there are prairie ceilings all over the place. And because the sod was gone, there's sunlight, they're germinating and coming really quick. Um, the second year, we had another flush of weeds in the more productive soil area, this lower area right here that's really yellow. We had to hay that again. But this area in front, the weeds weren't so bad and we left it alone. And we're able to actually then carry a fire in this third year. So where we didn't have the weed is quite as bad. The prairie looks a little more diverse than over here. Um, there's a lot of prairie there, but if you really look close, it's relatively few species that are dominating. And here's a close up of that in the third year. There's prairie there, a lot of species, uh, or th there are a lot of species there, but most of the cover is, is um, Dom, dominate, being dominated by a, a smaller number of species. And this site over time is doing okay. It's decent prairie, but it just doesn't have that high diversity that I'm seeing right next door. <laughs> this is a little higher up on the slope, so it's a little bit different soil, but this area here whoops, is just across the lane from this area here. And this is a CRP brome field. They were both part of the same brome field. The, the one over here to the left, uh, we sprayed and killed the sod. The one to the right here, we did not. We just started burning and it was planted in 1987. So rather, rather mature brome sod. Um, in the fall of 04 and 05, we overseeded uh, with a year, a year before we seeded with fire and then every year since. Um, it, it's part of a USDA CRP requirement planting and we used it, what I consider excessive amounts of warm season grass seed per their requirements. They have backed off on that now, but they're still requiring too much in my opinion. And it just came in heavy with warm season grasses. It's been burned nearly annually. Initially, the warm season grasses dominated, particularly Indian grass. However, starting in 2014, year 910, that's that getting that magical time period I said when the prairie starts to really express itself, rapid switch over to the to buyers to, excuse me, very diverse prairie began to begin, began to take place. The brome, I mean, the brome, the brome's still barely there, but the Indian grass in Big Blue are there, but they've really subsided 
from the Forbes are really expressing themselves and they've been getting a more diverse ever since. Um, some more examples of getting high diversity resulting from frequent fire. Uh, this is an actual remnant, um, a dry mesic remnant um, owned or managed by the prairie enthusiasts in Southwest Wisconsin. And you can see this pretty good diversity, equitability among species, rich in species, rich in diversity, um, an old remnant. Um, it's been on graze for at least 100 years or more. Um, in 1980, it was dominated by warm season grasses. It was a remnant that had been kind of left no burning going on. Uh, and just the warm season grasses were, were really pretty dominant on it. Um, started being burned periodically every three to four years since 1980. Um, the dominant grasses after 37 years of this periodic fire still include the warm season grasses, but the co-dominants in now include needle grass, non-native cool season grass, prairie drop seed, a very conservative uh, prairie grass of the high quality sites. It's technically warm season, but it has a uh, phenology very similar to cool season, kind of something in between warm and cool season and when it comes up. And then uh, one of my favorites, prairie panic grass, Dicantelium lebergii, a highly conservative, sensitive to grazing, likely was a co-dominant in our mesic and dry mesic prairies that's now rather uncommon. Um, and uh, it's really thriving now with the frequent fires. They were probably just being smothered by those big warm season grasses when the litter builds up, you might guess. Um, diversity is now much higher than in 1980, as you can see in this picture. Um, I'm gonna show you the case of Sugar River Savannah. Some of you have probably been on this. Um, this was a, a trial and ecosystem recovery and it's an example of interceding into pasture sod. This site was highly, highly degraded from the grazing. There were some native species present, but in exceedingly known low numbers in the more open, better soil prairie areas were truly dominated by non-native cool season grasses. It was a pasture. Um, habitat ranges from mesic to dry. In some areas are sandstone substrate. Um, there's both full sun areas and part shade areas, so it's prairie and savanna. Um, and it was interseeded over several years. This is a case where I kept adding seed over a 10 year period, but it was not the same species always every year. It, it, it varied on when I was able to get the seed. So it was a long term interseeding over several years. And, but there has been nearly annual fire for 40, well now 45 years, but at the time of the, most of these pictures, it was 40 years. The key here is, it's all been early spring burning. Uh, as a lot of you probably know, if you burn in late spring, you're gonna hyper stimulate the native warm season grasses. And if I had been burning late spring every year, it would probably be heavy in those grasses and not what you're gonna be seeing here. Um, so this is what, what happened after about 40 years results of this frequent fire interceding early spring burning almost annually. I'm going to go through the growing season. Uh, that's blue-eyed grass, swamp uh, wood betony, a little bit closer. Uh, as you can see, it's not taken over by warm season grasses. They're there. It's uh, developed what I would I call hyper diversity. Um, it averages about 27, 28 species per quarter of a square meter, not a square meter. Another key factor on this site is there's three semi-parasitic, well, two known semi-parasitic plants and one that's, there's no research on it, but it acts like it. I already talked about the wood betony. Another is commandra. That's what these little white flowers are here and these little stems of plants here. This is commander of false toad flax. And the other is uh, mountain mint, excuse me, not mountain mint, um, northern bed straw. Those three seem to be a key factor in getting a lot of this hyper diversity. 
but I think it takes annual fire for them to, to get the upper hand often in those situations. Well, at least it does for wood bedding. And even on the drive. Yeah, so if I could interrupt, there's two questions um, that we can work through. One, I think is a little more relevant to what your photos are showing now from Beth Rocco, or apologies if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, she asked that uh, your pictures show forbs and short grasses. They have an older planting. What do you do when big blue stem, big blue stem dominates and takes over? Yeah, there's several things you can do. Um, you can experiment with those grass specific herbicides. They're not going to kill it out, but they'll stress it, weaken it. Um, research in Iowa has found that summer mowing, like mid July to mid August, late mid to late summer mowing. And I, when I say mowing, I'm really mean haying where you're cutting and removing the material. If you cut it and let it lay, you can get a similar effect, but if you can cut and remove, excuse me, cut and remove, you can really stress those big grasses and make an opportunity for the forbs to start coming. Um, wood betony will drive out big blue stem. Oh, I'm gonna show that in a, in a few slides coming up later. Um, and uh, the frequent fire, but burning early spring, not late spring, to get the, you gotta get the litter off to get to the seed the sun to the ceilings and you have to see and you have to see climax forb species not the early successional ones the ones that are there for the long haul and and that's a thing for another topic but there's a whole list of these climax species that will come and come through big blue stem especially if you're removing the litter through fire burning the timing getting the hemiparasitic allelopathic plants established it can be done um, Quick follow up with that. Rich, Doug Hansman asks, um, what would you consider to be an unhealthy late date? So kind of what did you look at um, as the latest for a spring burn in a typical year? It, it depends on the site and what you're trying to accomplish. There is a place for burning in May when you have specific things you're trying to do. The general maintaining the diversity in general for Southern Wisconsin in a typical year, I try to not be burning past May 15th. Not, excuse me, April 15th, sorry. <laughs> April 15th, maybe April 20th, it's a late spring. Um, I, I don't burn into May unless there's some, some specific need like trying to knock out reed canary or, or some purpose. And, and then I wouldn't be doing it too often because if you keep doing it in May, you're going to lose a lot of these spring species or greatly stress them. Uh, this picture you're seeing right here, this is the Panicum labergii seed heads that I mentioned before, that native cool season grass. So you can see it's it's moving right, right into this site with the frequent early spring fires. This is down in the heavier soil. And we're moving through the season here. This is mesic soil. There's Indian grass and big blue stem in here. They just don't dominate. So we're getting more into mid, mid or to late summer here. So we're moving along. But it's, it's just this high diversity, you know, 25, 30 species per quarter of a square meter. And, and it's all the way through. It's just not those early spring things. It's all the way through the season. Oh, this is a dry, sandy area. And on those settings, especially sandy dry sites, those warm season grasses are going to be more prevalent. Uh, it's just the nature of the system, but but even but even on this dry site, there's still fairly good diversity of the forbs in it. And that's actually St. Peter's sandstone right here. So the forbs do do come. Um, so to finish this off, I'm going to just quickly go through 
kind of what the factors are that foster high diversity, high pluralistic diversity, um, um, not just species diversity, but actual diversity among the species in, in, in prairie. And this is just to, to give you an idea what's needed, you know, what was happening in the original prairies that kept their diversity high. Um, there was a component of herbivory, soil disturbance, plant warfare, that's that semi-parasitism semi or alleopathy, chemical warfare, um, dry and wet cycles. Uh, they're important to keeping the overall diversity high over time. And then, of course, I already talked about the role of fire involved. Uh, herbivory, we often think of the big ungulates, um, but this far east, they didn't play much of a role. Um, there were too many people. Bison were almost non-existent this far east, um, at least during the four to 5,000 years when prairies were actually moving into this area. We're talking modern bison, not by bison antiquitous that died out five, 6,000 years ago, but modern bison bison. Um, and even things like elk were here, but they were in such low numbers that they probably didn't have much of an influence. And even white-tailed deer, you know, were probably at, you know, one per square mile or something because there's just so many humans around. That all changed when diseases hit and by 1600, bison started to move, move east, but they weren't playing a big role in, in our prairies this far east. Small, small plant, excuse me, small mammals played a far greater, a greater role by far. Things like voles, the various mice species, and third clan ground squirrels and rabbits, um, they were influencing the vegetation. And this herbivory can cut both ways. If it gets too high, you start to lose diversity. But if you don't have a, enough of it, some species start to dominate because they're not being suppressed. So it, it, even with these herbivores, it's a balancing act. But then that's where the predators come in to help balance that. And that includes humans, we're important predators. But even more important were the insects. They had the largest effect, especially in our eastern prairies here. And a lot of that herbivory, unlike small mammals and the few large ungulates that are around, um, it, a lot of it was highly, highly targeted a lot of specialization of these insects to eat only one, in some cases, one species of plant or just one genus of plant. And in our upper Midwest here, our best guess is that in our prairies, we probably had 2,000 species of prairie specialist species that only lived in prairies. And a lot of those only ate certain plant species. Um, the best example of this specialization you find with the milkweeds, everyone knows about the monarch and the milkweeds with their alkaloids that only certain insects can eat them, period. But there's 13 other species out there that specialize just in milkweed. So, so that's like the prime example of the specialization and, and ability to suppress host plants. And all these insects do that with milkweeds. They keep their populations in check. Um, but there are all kinds of others. Leafhoppers, some 100, 100 prairie restricted leafhoppers in our prairies, 30 species of these apion weevils most of them specialize in one species of legume. Um, it just, it's endless. There's just it, it's so many as, examples of this. And just one example of how this uh, effect plays out, if you think of rosin weed, it's easy and fast to establish. And fast, in fact, it comes in so fast that I often hear people recommending do not plant it or be very careful how much you plant because it can be aggressive and come in fast. Yet, and high quality remnants and really mature plantings, they're not overrun by rosin weed. They're there, they're an important component, but they're not overrun. And why is that? You might have guessed, yeah, it's insects. There's at least six species, two moths, uh, four gall wasps that really, hand, really go after rosin weed. And this is an example of one of the moths just chewing the heck out of a, a rosin weed plant. It was about a third normal height, no flowering going on. So there's these checks and balances going on with the insects. And there's also parasitoid insects that attack the plant eating insects and there's parasitoids that attack the parasitoids. So there's this really complex interaction of species affecting the diversity and how these systems work. It's, it's pretty fascinating. And we're, we're still kind of scratching the surface on it. Um, speaking of that, this is cord, there's these two species that specialize on cordgrass. 
they've only been identified and looked at in the past, the name put on in the past 10 years. And the only reason that was done is cord grass had been looked at as a, a potential for biomass production. And so they started doing research on what things might be attacking it. And they thought start finding these insects that just live on cord grass. Soil disturbance. And the big ungulates could have done some of that. Like I said before, there weren't many of them around. Medium and small mammals were the key key factors here. Think think of badger dens and their foraging, not only their dens, but their foraging all the time. And you're finding holes dug everywhere. Uh, coyote, fox, woodchuck dens, a pocket gopher and mole tunnels. Uh, all of these micro disturbance areas provide uh, early successional habitat for the prairie species that need that to keep their populations going strong. And then things like ant mounds. Um, these Formica ants go way down and bring mineral soil up to the surface so that they're kind of doing a slow tilling of the soil over hundreds of years. And that uh, helps keep the diversity up by preventing certain species that just take over and dominate completely. Um, fluctuation and precipitation, drought and dry periods are critical. Drought periods, you can get dieback of some things like sumac that invade, but you can also get grasses dying out or going dormant. Little blue stem, for example, you think of that as a dry prairie species, but if you get a bad enough summer drought, it actually dies. Whereas big blue stem and Indian grass just kind of go dormant. Um, and you get these community shifts. So you'll see a prairie remnant in wet years, it looks, you'd call it dry mesic, almost mesic prairie, but in dry cycles, you would call it a dry prairie because different species dominate during those different periods of precipitation fluctuation. Um, summer drought of 2012, um, for example, um, big blue stem went dormant and the wood betony that lives on the big blue stem died. It, uh, it relies on the big blue stem for the moisture and when the big blue stem went dormant, it died. And so there was a community shift for years after until the wood betony came back again. Um, spring droughts, um, any of those that can remember back to some bad spring droughts like 1987, uh, all of the spring, we didn't get rain till late June, no rain in May, April, May, June. A um, lot of early blooming things uh, died out. Um, wet periods, you can get these community shifts in prairies, dry mesic prairies, wet years, you get uh, a lot of Indian grass and in drier years, you get more big blue stem. Um, recruitment events, I did my masters on a remnant and kept collecting data for like 12 years on a dry mesic remnant full of lead plant everywhere as a dominant plant. But in those 12 years, there was only one year I saw any seedling establishment of lead plant and that was during a very wet year. So you can think of some of these things living in dry sites, but unless there's an occasional wet year, once those long lived plants are once there, they stay there, they got deep roots, but they won't get started in those sites unless there's a wet year. And then the effects of fire um, and the seasonal timing is, is really important. I kind of talked about this already um, and the frequency, I talked about that being important. Um, here's an example of both timing and frequency. This is an area of reed canary grass. And right over here, up in this corner, there's a line here, a property line. And this side has not had any burning or seeding or anything. And you can see the typical reed canary grass domination. This side was like that. And then we started being burned annually or nearly so for 36 years and it was interceded. The burning here alternated between early spring and late spring because the best time to knock back reed canary is to either burn and or mow uh, in the May first part of June. What I found was that late spring burn was so effective in reducing the reed canary grass, there was not enough fuel to carry a late spring burn the next year. So you had to do an early spring burn. But this is after uh, 36 years of this ro rotating fires through pretty frequently, some interceding. And this is, happens to be a year following a late spring burn. 
and you can see all the expression of the forbs and the reduced stats, stature of the reed canary and almost no flowering going on. Uh, available nitrogen is another really important factor when it comes to fire. Uh, nitrogen, nitrogen and I think sulfur are the two elements that are lost when you burn the litter. They're volatilized or put back up into the atmosphere. Um, and nitrogen in the prairies are, it's important, all the plants need it, but most of the native prairie plants are very efficient users of nitrogen. And the prairie um, has nitrogen, but it's all spoken for. There's not a lot of available nitrogen. And the more you burn, the less available nitrogen there is. It's, it's tied up underground. And so the more you burn, the less available nitrogen slowly over time and a competitive edge you give to the native plants, over, especially over the non-native cool season plants, grasses, which are essentially what I call nitrogen hogs. You, the more nitrogen you give them, the more they're going to grow, the better they're going to do. The less nitrogen, the, the more suppressed they become or, or less productive. Whereas the native plants, they don't respond that way. Our legumes, for example, they're all nitrogen fixers. So the more you reduce available nitrogen, the better they do. They have a competitive edge. And you'll find the more you burn these areas, the more prevalent legumes tend to become on them. Uh, and then there's the, the dilemma of fire and insects, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about this. It's a, a real a concern, especially if you're dealing with remnants. But here's the bottom line. It's a concern for a limited number of highly specialized rare insects. For most of the insects, by far, it's, it's, it's not an issue. Um, when you burn in these grasslands, roughly... 60% of those species are not going to be have any measurable, see any measurable effect of the fire. About a 30% from in general increase immediately with the fire. About 30% seem to be unaffected. But about 40% of the species are reduced following a fire. Um, they aren't necessarily eliminated from the site, and some are, and they have to recolonize, but most of them sur survive on site and just have to rebuild their population. The good news of those that 40%, the vast majority have rebounded by the end of that first season, whether they're coming in from adjacent unburned areas or just repopulating from on-site survival. Um, those, a small percentage might take two years and a really tiny percentage might take three years. So those species that take two or three years, if they happen to be highly restricted prairie specialists and they're sensitive to fire, that's where you have to be careful how much you burn of the site and how often you burn. And to for your restoring new sites, the odds of having that, those specialized species is exceedingly low to non-existent. Unless you're planting next to a remnant, and those things can move out from the remnant, uh, eventually then uh, you, you, it'd be advisable to back off on how much you're burning and frequent, how frequently you're burning. Um, but it's for a very limited number of species if that helps you think about it any better. But it's a real concern for uh, some, high, some rare, highly restricted species, especially when you're dealing with remnants. Um, the upside though, when you burn, you may have noticed that you get a tremendous increase in flowering following fire. And think about that from the insect's perspective. You're gonna have more pollen, more nectar, and more seeds for all those things that eat seeds from insects to birds to small mammals. So even for that 40% that are reduced and, and most of which recover by the end of the first year anyways, even for those that take more than one year, um, it's often a case of short-term loss for long-term gain uh, because of the increase in resources made available to those populations. Uh, here's just an example of a couple species. This is pale purple coneflower. These are side-by-side -side plot comparisons. You got one area that's been unburned for six years. These are all burned in the same year. The area unburned for six years, this is the level of flower stems per individual, the measure of 
flower production, a site that was burned that year, but, but it had been two years since the last fire, and a site that burned that year had been five years since the last fire. And this tremendous increase in flowering that occurs at this species is just phenomenal. This is uh, wild quinine in the same area. Now, not all of the prairie species have this dramatic effect from flowering, but the majority of them do increase the flowering. Not all, there's some exceptions. Um, So these checks and balances, these keystone plant species, I already mentioned them, the, there's, there's a hemiparasitic or semi-parasitic, the chemical warfare, those that put out chemicals that suppress their neighbors. Um, there's a specialized insects that go after some plants that help suppress, keep them in check, so to speak. And there's also a bunch of diseases. Um, big blue stem, for example, um, after about 40 to 50 years, big blue stem starts to decline on sites. This first was being reported in some of the older restorations done, like in Illinois and, and Southeast Wisconsin, where the, the manager was coming back and said, my big blue stem's dying, what's happening? And that was about 40, 40 to 50 years in. It turns out there's a bunch of insects and diseases that go after big blue stem, and it just takes that long for the system to kind of uh, re redevelop those checks and balances. Um, these are the three keystones I mentioned before, the wood betony, semi-parasitic, the commander or false toad flax, semi-parasitic, well-documented. The northern bed straw seems to be doing the same thing. I, there's nothing in the literature that I can find, whether either being allelopathic or semi-parasitic, but it seems to be having the same effect. And that mountain mint I mentioned too before, I can't find anything in the literature, but it seems to be having a very similar effect. Um, here's a clump of big blue stem. You got a lot of high foliage, maybe two, three feet tall, and then the big flower stalks up seven, eight feet. And then five feet away, this area was burned, five feet away, hence all the flowering. Five feet away, another clump of big blue stem. And if you can see what's right smack dab in the middle of this is a wood betony plant. This foliage is maybe 10 inches tall. There's zero flowering going on. Wood betony has an effect on grasses. This is a, a restoration. This is one of the older inner seeding areas. You can see, see this heavy, heavy Indian grass here and over here. It used to be like that all the way across this, that area right there. You can see there's some grass foliage here, but no flower stalks. And then areas where you can't even not make out any foliage of Indian grass and just disappeared. Well, with betony. There's wood betony here on the outer edge flowering. The wood betony in the middle, there's still a few little plants here, but it's starting to die out. Wood betony knocked out the grasses, dies out in the middle and keeps moving. So it's like an amoeba moving across the site, knocking down the grasses. And then when it departs, the grasses start to come back and a lot of forbs come in. And just a, a, a caution, this diversity takes time. Remnants are thousands of years old. Recover, recovering plantings and restorations may take a couple centuries to, to even get really close to that original state. We don't know, but it's a very slow process. There are these conservative climax species that I mentioned before are slow to establish, or it's hard to get seed um, for them to get them going. Um, there's a maturing of all these interactions that I've mentioned that take time to redevelop. And then often there's a first come first serve effect on these sites. So if you don't get all of the diversity you see in your first planting to start out with just a few species, it's going to take time for those other species to be gaining a foothold when they have to compete and come in, especially if like, for example, you planted too much big blue stem at the outset. Now you're going to have to deal suppressing it to get these other climax things going. Um, and in both both situations, so um, that's it, I guess. If there's any other questions? Great, thank you, Rich. We do have a couple questions, so Micah and I will start working through the questions that are already in the chat box, and we would invite anybody else to pop more questions in there. 
Um, how about first, Rich, we've got a question from Brooke Lewis about interceding and burn timing. Do you recommend that you uh, intercede in the spring after the burn or in the winter frost seeding prior to the burn going through the unit? Yeah, good question. Um, I, uh, fall, fall seeding is just best over around, all around. And, and that's because of the frost, what we call the frost seeding, the seed gets worked into the ground. What, and, and it, it may be counterintuitive thinking that, well, isn't that burning gonna burn up my seed come spring if I seed in the fall? Um, again, I'd like to see research on this to quantify what effect it has, but all I can say is I had great success. Um, most, I, I'm just assuming most of that seed by spring has worked into that soil and that soil surface. And um, as long as you're not burning late in the spring and killing off any seedlings that have germinated, um, I, it, it seems to be working. Now for some species, bigger seeds, if you had drilled them in, maybe you'd gotten more, been able to get more plants out of the seed. I don't know, it's, it's quite conceivable. But all I can say is it's been working extremely well. I would, I do not advise spring seeding. Um, you'll, you'll get prairie coming, but it's not gonna be nearly as rich and diverse. It's gonna be slower to develop. Um, the fall seeding is just so much better for, for all, almost all the forbs and a lot of the conservative grasses. Does Great. that answer it? Yeah, I think so. We've got a question too. This came earlier in the presentation when you were showing slides out at Mounds View uh, and talking about the area that you had to mow and hay repeatedly because of the eight foot ragweed. Is there a concern that the mowing or haying treatment does damage to the prairie seedlings? This area? Yes. Um, oh. Yep. I don't know. Um, it, it, obviously, the tractor, there's tire compaction. Um, it's done in midsummer. It depends on how wet the ground is, would be my guess. Um, some of these, see, some of these. Not, not all the seeds, that's another good point. Not all the seeds are gonna germinate that first year. Uh, prairie plants, you know, it's wild seed. So you have this genetic diversity and prairie plants are known, most of them are known for germinating over multiple years. So you seed it one year and you're gonna have seeds germinating out of that cohort for the next five, six years. So if there's any bad event in that one year, they're not all lost. So given the amount of area covered by the tractor tire and the time of year and not all your eggs are in one basket, I don't think it's gonna have much of an effect, but research could maybe demonstrate some quantitative difference, I don't know. Mm -hmm. All I can tell you is if you didn't remove that litter, you would have lost a high percentage of those seed. Yep trade-offs. All right, another question here about seed sourcing. Do you have recommendations to share with the group about places to get good quality seeds and appropriate species for restorations and interseeding? Well, I can't play any favorites. <laughs> um, I, I would, my, I, I personally, I think you should try to get genetic material that is close to your geographic area as you can. And so, sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, and a lot of the nurseries that we have in, in Wisconsin and, and very nearby, like in, in Minnesota, if you ask them that you're trying to get local genetics, a lot of them know their sources of where their beds came from and they, they will tell you. And they can offer, some, some of them can offer, yeah, we, we got seed from this Southern Wisconsin for these species and I'll let you know. Now, whether their beds have stayed true over time or they're just telling you that, <laughs> I don't know. I just take them for their word. Um, I think it's more important to stay away from any horticultural versions of things um, and to try to stick with things that are actually 
known or likely to have been indigenous to your area. Um, I, I know there's climate change going on and people talk about assisted migration, but I'm a little nervous about people deliberately doing that without really knowing what the real changes are going to be. We, we have guesses, but we don't know how each species is going to respond. So I tend to try to stick with species native to the area, get species that match the soil substrate and soil moisture conditions. And then third, start work worrying about how far out you go genetically to get the seed. For most of these things, you can get reasonably close. You don't have to be going to Kansas and Nebraska uh, to get seed. Great, <clears throat> thank you. We have another question here specifically about wood betony and recommendations you might share for getting that established in a stand of Indian grass or a stand dominated by Indian grass. Yep. Uh, either uh, fall or early spring burning or some hay. Uh, e either one seems to be helpful in getting, even though it's semi parasitic and lives off those grasses. Apparently, in the first years, um, before they make those connections, they need sunlight. And so I've rarely seen it come into heavy grass stands where either it's not hayed and cut and removed or the litter's been burned off. And even then, you know, you're not maybe one, one out of every three attempts, it really establishes. And it, it, from my observations, I think it's a relatively short-lived plant. Um, it kind of, it looks like it's spreading vegetatively and it, it will, you know, out a foot or something into a round area. But most, I wish there's genetic work done on it, but from my observations, most of that reproduction is being done by heavy seed that falls close by. So um, if you get one wood betony plant started in a site, I've never seen them successfully establish a population, which another reason makes me think they're not spreading vegetatively. They're probably, probably obligate outcrossers. So you gotta put out enough seed to get enough plants to have a minimum viable population established that, that can take off and grow. Um, I've often seen sites that get one, two, three, or four, or five plants, and they just never seem to get rolling and produce enough. It may be a pollination issue or, or what, I don't know. So the more seed you can get and plant it in clusters uh, seems to be the most effective. But even then, about one, only about one out of every three attempts, even if a good, good amount of seed uh, takes. But when it takes, um, uh, be prepared. You saw what happened to the Indian grass. And I, I've had people, I don't wanna say they're upset with me, but they've come back and say, you've you ruined my prairie. I, I planted wood betony and it took over. And I said, well, what other species were present? Because the wood betony is gonna knock down the big grasses. And if you don't have other things there ready to take advantage of the opportunity, yeah, it's not gonna look so good. So the key is get those climax conservative things there so they can be there to take advantage of the wood betony when it does, if it does take off for you and suppress the grasses. As I mentioned though, it's, it's a temporary thing because those plants die out and that colony keeps moving and eventually those grasses come back. You know, it's, it's like a 15, 20 year cycle. Got it. All right, I think we've got two more questions here. Oh, there's more coming in, we'll see. At least two more and then we'll think about winding things down for the night. The first question is a follow-up from the timing, the planting timing question that you took earlier. Um, for this year, is it too late to do that fall, winter frost seeding prior to a planned spring burn? I don't, well. I've, I've, done, I've done plantings in, in February and March, and I, I, haven't, I haven't done quantitative work. Well, there's so many variables. One is the quality of seed, how much seed, what species to try to control for between these plantings. Um, it, it, it worked, it, and planting in the spring will work too. It's just not as 
good as, as effective. You, you still get plants coming, but just don't get as many. So I, I would still, I, I think planting now is going to be more beneficial than waiting to spring. I guess that would be my answer. It would have been better to do it a month ago, but I think now is better than waiting till spring. And if you do do it in the spring, do it as early as you can. Don't don't wait till um, mid May. Great. All right. I think we're going to take one last question and then wrap things up. I do see a couple of questions. Mike, I see this question about pollinator habitat, and I might actually use that as a plug to recommend that people attend our next two presentations, both of which will cover different aspects of establishing and creating great pollinator habitat. But for closing right now, we've got, I think, a question that will summarize things nicely, and that is your recommended seeding rate. So when you're building one of these seed mixes, Rich, for an interseeding situation, what is your seeding rate? How many seeds per square foot do you recommend? As much as you can get your hands on. There are a few species, well, big more season grasses, I'd either not start with them at all and be very, very light. And there's a few allele, maybe some of the sunflowers, be careful, don't do too much. And maybe some others, fast coming thing, yellow cone flowers, black eyed Susan, Bernard, I'd you know, take it, don't, don't go overboard. But the conservative things, the early bloomers, I, I don't, I, I can't imagine you're having too much shooting star seed or too much violet or blue eyed grass or basically as much as you can get. The general rule of thumb on these plantings, and I don't know how much research is behind it, but the people shoot for 40 seeds per square feet of all of your species. That's what people recommend a lot. So you, you gotta go back and figure the average seeds per ounce of each of the species and back calculate and be careful on some of the, the bigger, coarser, more aggressive plants. Um, but a lot of the smaller conservative things, I, I don't think you can overplant. Great. Very good. Well, I think we will leave it there. I want to say thank you to Rich. Thank you very much for this presentation full of wonderful tidbits and information. I bet a lot of people were writing down notes and are going to go use some of this information. And I also want to thank all of the participants for joining us. It looked like we tapped out at 53, which is very good turnout. Um, we do welcome feedback. This is the first time that the Blue Mountains Area Project has bravely stepped into the virtual Zoom webinar space. So feel free to send you know, comments or feedback to myself or Micah, and we will fine tune our game. So hope to see you again in two weeks and then again two weeks after that for our final two winter lecture series. And thank you, everybody. Take care. Good, Good night. night. <sighs>